Hey everybody, it's Jacqueline Fletcher Johnson. I am so excited to have my very first, Lorna, you are the first. Um, Yay. My, my very first comedian on the show. And so I wanna just say a few things about Lorna before we get started. And I'm gonna try not to be so excited because I keep hitting my chin on the, my little spit thing. Um, my little my little thing that keeps my peas from popping. But um, so I want to introduce Lorna Landvik. And she is the author of 12 novels, right? Is it 12? It is 12, yep. 12 novels. And I have read many of them. I have, including her first book, which was Patty Jane's House of Curl. Hilarious. Um, also, I've read, I know I've read the um, Angry Housewives Eating Bonbons. You can tell that these are books that... Um, if they resonate with you, you definitely have to read. And her latest book is The Chronicles of the Radical Hag, which I have not read yet, but I will be reading uh, very soon. So um, I'm super happy to have Lorna here. She's also an um, entertainer. She has a one-woman improv show that she does every year at Bryant Lake Bowl here in Minneapolis that is called Party in the Rec Room, right? It's Party yep. in the Rec Room. And um, I, this was another thing that you had on your website that I thought was really interesting. It was the, um, you are an antic dealer. So I wanna hear more about that. Um, and so Lauren and I know each other. We were both on the board at the Loft Literary Center in Minneapolis, which is this amazing institution for writers. Um, and so she, we've been friends for a long time. I adore her, she's fantastic. And she agreed to do this and I'm so grateful. And so welcome Lorna, how are you? Tell us about yourself. Oh, thank you so much. I don't have a pee popper stopper, so I might pop a lot of my b b peas. Um, so excuse moi ahead of time. And as you can see, I, my studio is the uh, spare room where I also sew and maybe take naps and it's all cluttered. And I was trying to have a, a very dreamy kind of back screen, but I don't. So here we are. This is life, people. Yes, those are old sweatshirts hanging from my back door. That's what you see. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. And uh, so to when, tell us, too, because you, you were also, you did stand-up, didn't you, for a while? I did years and years ago when I lived in L.A. And I had so much fun. Um, but then I was introduced to improv and I preferred improv so much more because you got to do a different thing every night and make it up and stand up, you know, it kept being hammered into my head. You got to hone your five minutes. You got to hone your five minutes. And I never liked doing the same thing over and over and over again, but it was really fun. I'm one of these people. I love LA. I had so much fun there. Um, and moved back to Minneapolis, though, and actually got a lot more work than I ever did in L.A., more fun work. Because, you know, when I was in L.A., I was very young, and so people saw me, like, more as a young ingenue and sent me out for those kind of parts, which I always bridled at. And now, of course, what I would yearn to be sent out for. Um, but in, in Minneapolis, I, I got hired by Dudley Riggs, and I just met so many fun people. Um, and so, yeah, if I can balance somehow, or it's never a real balance, but I love to perform um, not as much as I love to write. It's a very, very close race, though. And I feel like performing allows me to get out of the house and get immediate reaction, whereas when you write, you know, you can't sit next to somebody. Oh, how'd you like that part? What do you think of that? You know, um, although you may hear from your readers later. Uh, but I just, for me, it works really well. It's really fun to perform on stage and also create my own little worlds uh, on the page. Yeah, I love that. Well, and I, I was so struck, too, by something that you said um, you know, in one of your, I, I know I had read Best to Laugh as well, which that was about your time, right, as a stand-up comic? Yeah, yeah, that was the closest autobiographically I've ever written. Yeah, and I remember um, on that book, I was just kind of reviewing kind of your, your work and looking at that one, and I just thought, 
you know, just from a title perspective, I mean, the story is fantastic. And just from a title's perspective, like in these times right now, when you talk about being trapped in your house as a writer, like, you, you know, you're doing that on a regular basis as you're writing books and not getting feedback until you, you know, go out into the world. Um, and so you do this beautiful entertaining, but now everybody's trapped in our houses and we're here in this weird space and time. And a lot of people are really stressed out and going through really hard things. And people continue to be, you know, about, I think it's about 5,000 people continue to be diagnosed with cancer every single day, even through all of this. And so I was looking at, you know, just scanning through your work and um, that title just really struck me again, you know, that it's best to laugh. And I wondered if you could talk about, you know, A, where that came from for you, and then B, what, why is laughter so, in your mind, such a tonic, such a wonderful thing for us? Well, in answer to A, um, my dad and mom were both funny. And, you know, I was raised in an all Norwegian household. I mean, my ancestry, but those, that Norwegian-ness certainly uh, pervaded the household. And, oh no, you first. Oh no, not me. Um, also, very Lutheran, although not weirdly Lutheran. Um, and they were storytellers. And I also was raised as the youngest only girl of three brothers. And um, I learned that if you can make somebody laugh, you're less likely to get punched, you know, or tackled or, um, and I had a great group of friends and man the girl power was so strong in my neighborhood and um, we lauded each other's ability to make each other laugh and b why is laughter so important i don't know but it's like a, a magic elixir and you just after a good laugh it's like you've worked out you've had a little romp in the bed, uh, you know, it just, it's such a relief, you know, and um, I think what I look for in humor is that surprise. It, just because it's so universal too, um, it, it just, it's like we're all holding hands when we laugh, you know. Yeah. It is like that. It really is. It feels that way. Take my hands, Jackie. Oh, okay. There, there. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and so when you do, I just, you know, we're going to ramble around today. Yeah, we're going to ramble. Let's just ramble. And we're I'm rambling women. We are. And we're, we're radical hags, too, which I love. Amen. I wish more people were radical hags, including men. I love that. I want to, I want to sign up to be one. Like, do you have a, like a pin or like a club I can join and get like my little sticker so that I can put it on my, like, where do if I, I were, if I were more media business savvy, I certainly would have that, but no, I don't have that. So right now you just have to um, cling the radical haggedness to your heart and then spread it out in the world. Okay, so I'm going to help you with that because we need to have a radical hag. In or okay. I mean, that's just, I need one. Right on. All right. Okay, so the radical hag, I have not read it yet, but I intend to. And the, the one thing that I loved about reading just the, the reports of it was that it's about this columnist who's a newspaper columnist. Yeah. And she has very strong opinions about life. And she... When, as a columnist should. As a columnist should, yes. Yeah. And when she upsets a reader, she offers a recipe. Is that, the, is that kind of the crux of the thing? Like, you tell me about this book. The book is called uh, Chronicles of a Radical Hag with Recipes. And she begins her career in the early 60s and um, has a lot of uh, fans in her readership, but she has the occasional... Uh, what is now called troll, 
And um, one particular troll is a man named Mr. Joseph Snell, who thinks women have their places and their places are always, you know, behind men. And she just writes a column one day about keeping her own name. Um, it's her identity. And, you know, when asking her husband, would you ever change your name if we got married? No, why would I? It's my name. And men don't ever consider what it's like to all of a sudden go from, you know, Nancy Johnson to Mrs. Walter Peterson. He writes a letter and um, it's nothing but the ravings of a radical hag. And she, because she's a woman and she wants everybody to get along, um, she decides to publish recipes as sort of a mollifier. And they are my and my mother's recipes and they're really good um i absolutely urge everybody to make the the almond crescent cookies and i have done a lot of events for that book and sometimes libraries or bookstores have actually baked those cookies but i tell them you have to take teeny tiny pieces of dough and roll them and shape them because sometimes they're as big as boomerangs you know the ones that have been made they're good but I always like the idea of a small cookie because you can eat more. Um, so we follow Hayes Evans through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and up to her uh, 81st year when she's so excited about the opportunity to vote for her first woman. You know, her own mother was lived in a time where she couldn't even vote. And um, she does have her... Uh, ideas about uh, Hillary Clinton's running mate and wonders why he announced his presidency when he was gliding down the escalator like he was going to a shoe sale at Nordstrom's. Um, but it's it's uh, a book, you know, she loves people. She loves life. She has her, her ideas about it and she's not shy about expressing them. And so that's what that book is about. Oh my gosh, I have to read that immediately. I cannot wait. And so where did where did this come from? You know, I mean, these are these are the questions that everybody asks as writers. And, you know, my daughter has recently decided she's going to be a poet. She loves poetry. Wow. Oh, I'm so excited. So last night she came into my bedroom uh, late, you know, pretty late. She's like, Mom, I've written another poem. May I read it to you? I'm like, yes, absolutely. She did this beautiful, dramatic reading of this poem. And so she's decided to do a 30 day poem, you know, poetry challenge. And so we were talking about this idea about creativity and, you know, where do ideas come from? And she asked me like, what if I run out of ideas? I was like, oh, there's ideas everywhere. And it's like big game and you get to play. And so we talked about, um, you know, just combining things that didn't go together. And so when I was an editor, I used to do that a lot. I would be like, okay, what are the you know ideas we're gonna do for the editorial calendar for the year? And we would say, well, what if we did this kind of article and an article about, um, I don't know, let's say, what, what, what would be something we should do an article about? Oh, you're asking me? Let's do an article on uh, climate change. Okay. So if we're going to do an article on climate change in dog fancy, if we're going to do an article on climate change in Vogue, if we're going to do it in um, Pilot Today, so we would play in that way, you know, in the, in the editorial um, room. And so we were talking about that last night about when you get stuck and, you know, you, keep there, that you can't come up with ideas um, about anything, that play is this, the best and easiest way to kind of get back into your curiosity. And so I'm curious for you because, you know, I just, I love all your work so much. It's so hilarious. You're so prolific as a writer. You continue to, you know, publish novels and do these beautiful online, you know, or not online, excuse me, these onstage shows and perform around. And, and you are a person who actually gets up on stage and then creates out of just what's in the air. And so all of that rambling is to say, you know, what is it that inspires you? How do you, like, where do you get your fire for creation? Where does it come from? Well, I think you're right. It comes from everywhere. And I, right now, I'm just fascinated by your idea about writing an article about climate change for Vogue. Like, ladies, do you realize that if 
if our temperature increases, it's going to mean more sleeveless dresses. And for those of us of a certain age, who wants to show those bat wings? So fight the power. Um, but I like, uh, I like to daydream. I think looking out a window is a very important part of writing. I think just walking without any earbuds on or anything. And I do, you know, in these COVIDian times, I get my release from taking our dog to the dog park. And because um, we can still be outside. And I don't really know where my ideas come from the characters come into my head they come with their names because they're so polite um and i'm immediately given like a, a just brief snapshot of who they are like when hayes evans came into my head right away i know i knew okay she is an octogenarian columnist for a mid-sized town newspaper yeah. It's technology, it just, it startles me, it baffles me. I thought I had my phone on mute. Um, so I just am never shy about where these people come from or why they come. I don't question it. I just think, thank you, and I begin to write. I never write by outline, um, even though that was the prescription my, you know, ninth grade English teacher insisted about, you've got to write by your outline and I I never know what's going to happen so an outline doesn't serve me um, it may if I you know were to write mysteries or thrillers where I'd have to know things in advance but I don't um, so I just would tell your daughter um, to just feel free enough to be silly about anything and and not dismiss any kind of idea and um yeah in looking out the window oh a window pane what does what does that bring to you um and just play i think like improvisation on stage writing is improvisation because it's the first time you're doing it you know the revision is also a part of writing but your initial writing is improvisation you're making it up right then and there. Yeah, that's true. That is true. You know, it's so interesting. I interviewed another woman who teaches improv within the healthcare system. Her name is Sarah Horst. And it was really interesting. So we played some improv games and all of that. But her perspective that she teaches to healthcare executives is that improv is actually a way of life because we're all improving every day, all day long. And it was so interesting because when my daughter came in last night, one of the things that happened was, you know, we were talking about creativity and this, and, you know, if she really wants to be a poet, maybe she could explore, you know, some other poets and she reads a ton anyway. But uh, so I read her a poem by our poet laureate, US poet laureate, Joy, and I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Is it Harjo? Har I don't know how to pronounce her last name. And we Norwegians always say the J O as Yo Haru, but I think you're right. I, yeah, I don't know. And she is an indigenous woman and um, fantastic poet, just an amazing writer. And so I had pulled up one of her poems called Remember to read to my daughter last night. And I read it to her, and we were both by the end of this poem, like, you know, our jaws were on the floor. I mean, it was so beautiful and so powerful and I watched my daughter immediately go oh, like I could never do that I'm not that good and I just immediately was like stop it right now it's like that is a woman who is closing in on 70 who has spent way more than 10,000 hours learning how to do the, her craft she has lived this full and rich life and she has practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and learned and discovered and found. And she is a master at the top of her game. And I was right. like, I was like, no, 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 no. That is a complete waste of energy to compare ourselves to other artists. Like your job is to simply say, what about that is so inspiring and beautiful? And what about that makes my heart sing? And that's it. That is all, my friend. And it was super interesting that her, you know, she's 12 that her initial response already at this age is comparing herself so directly to that um, and judging herself uh, you know, negatively for it. And so 
it just really struck me last. It just happened last night. So well, it's it's so true that old saying, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. And yeah. you know, I would ask your daughter, hmm, what kind of poetry do you think she was writing at age twelve? You know, well, great question. When this is over, I immediately want to go read some of her poetry. So thank you. It's beautiful. She is so gifted. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually want to uh, read much more of her work. It's just gorgeous. And especially, you know, now in times like this too, I've been thinking about it. What We turn to the arts, we turn to the artists. And that's one of the things where, you know, when I started this show, um, you know, my family, they call me the serious one. I mean, I've been accused of being the serious one. And I wasn't that way when I was a kid. I laughed a lot when I was a kid. And so when I was had this idea to start this, you know, the, the holy crap, I got cancer during the coronavirus comedy show. Uh, I, I was laughing about this so much. And I called one of my brothers and told him about this idea that I wanted to do this. And, he, uh, you know, and so we were howling with laughter and because we just used to laugh together as kids all the time. And and um, I said, when did I, when did I become the serious one? And he was like, oh, about 30. <laughs> well, why do, why do you think that was? Oh, probably. Was that just their impression of you, or do you feel that was true also? Wait a minute. Are you interviewing me, or am I interviewing you? <laughs> <laughs> I want to know this about you, Jackie. What do you think the, that you think this came from? <laughs> Oh, I think I got married into a step oh. family and I suddenly had three little kids running around, you know, I'm like, oh, I must wow. be serious now. Yeah, that would do it for anybody. Yeah, I think that's probably why. But and so it's been such a joy to uh, to do this work that is rooted in laughter, but really is about so many things. And I love that we're talking about creativity today on a comedy show. It's super fun. So thank you for doing this. This is just a ball. Um, and so when you know when you're playing on stage yeah i mean it takes there's i mean you know this that being in front of an audience is like a greater fear for most people than a fear of death and so what is it about that experience that what, what what i guess what is it that when you get on that stage it makes you comfortable to be there or are you comfortable to be there in a way that's because I mean, that's a risky situation, right? You get on stage, you don't know what's ha going to happen. You don't know what anybody's going to say from the audience. You don't have any idea what kind of show is going to be created or if it's going to be, you know, good, right? Because that's what some, some of us start judging ourselves around. And you just wing it. And so what I'm connecting to right now with that whole art, and I want you to, would love to hear your perspective on this, is that like we are in these times of great uncertainty. And so my husband, he works in continuing education at a university and he just ran a webinar for people that was about like dealing with change and dealing with uncertainty and how do we face times like this? And people, when people are scared and they're put in a risk environment, how do you continue to be creative? And so you are putting yourself in a risk environment on purpose. And I just would love to share with the audience like those connections between what you do on purpose and what we're all living in right now, where we really need to be able to do that. Well, Jackie, I think that everybody has their fears and the stage is just some place where I feel comfortable. On. I've always felt comfortable as a performer. I've always felt like this is my home. And that goes back to childhood and, you know, plays and talent shows in grade school, junior high. Um, but if you take me out of that, pardon me? I'm sorry, you've never had like stage fright or felt afraid? You well, just I have stage fright, but in very different um, settings. Like when I have been a board member I uh, I never talked because uh, you know when they would discuss the financials and everything that was just oh out of my league um, we used to go to this church um, and I would occasionally be called upon to give a reading 
and we always sat in the back pew. We're back seat sitters because we like to take the long view. Even if we go to the movies, we love to sit in the back view. And I would go up there, and I don't know if it was because I, maybe I didn't exactly believe everything I was reading or I couldn't riff on it, but I'd be like this. <laughs> and Jake upset, and my husband would be back in the back row. Roar! Because <laughs> you know, I would just... I was out of my element. Um, but when I'm on stage, I just feel like this isn't about me. It's about everybody here, and it's about a good time. It's, it's like when you're hosting a party. I never like to think it's about me and the food I'm serving and the drinks I'm making, but it's about everybody else, and I just want everybody to have a good time. So that's really my impetus. I want everybody to have a good time. Right before the stage lights go on and I go on stage, I can't say I'm nervous. I'm more like, oh, good. Let's see what's going to happen. Some nights are, you know, better than others. Some nights I have a character that I just think, yes, she nailed it. Other nights I think, oh, boy, I'm glad there isn't a refund policy. Uh, but, no, I just I want everybody to have a good time and yet i would be very very fearful um you know in situations that other people think are exactly easy and normal you know i could never be um a doctor i could never be a pilot um ferrying people way up in the sky you know um, i'd freak out so we all have our our strengths and where we feel most comfortable. And for me, the stage has always seemed like a safe place, even if I, I bomb. And, you know, in comedy, uh, it's inevitable that you'll bomb, you know, doing stand up. I had a really good friend and she and I would be at the comedy store and sometimes we wouldn't get on until, you know, one in the morning and the crowd was either drunk or, you know, just fed up. And yet, we could laugh about our, oh, that, that hurt. Uh, but it was funny. And we knew it was dues paying. Um, just like I think my first novel, you know, it got rejected so many times. But from reading about other writers, I knew that that was part of the, the game. Um, you, unless you're extremely lucky and you hit right away, you know that rejection is on this road that you travel and you have to ask yourself, am I going to keep on this road or am I just going to go to a rest stop and forget it all and, and cry and regret everything and no, damn it, no. I gotta go through the rejection and, and the heckling. I actually kind of like hecklers. It's I like to be heckled. You get hecklers? Yeah, especially in my family. Um, like what? Like no, what? Occasionally, occasionally I will, even though my show isn't a stand-up show, it's an improvisation show. And I'm so everybody's yelling things out. So, no, I can't really say I get heckled because yelling things out is a part of that show anyway. So you the know? entire audience is heckling yeah. Uh, Ms. Lorna Landvik will be doing um, some improv for us in a live stream. What? <laughs> Come yes, and use your suggestions. And yes, so you guys are going to be the audience. We're going to set that all up. It's going to be coming up. I'm so supremely excited about this. So stay tuned. You know, it's so funny. I just I was um, on Facebook the other day and a friend of mine was like, you guys, I need some humor stat. And, you know, everybody started, like you said, that Stephen King had done this and, that, you know, that everybody put links to their funny things and told jokes and, you know, all of this stuff. And by the end of this whole like string of comments and the end of the day, she said, oh my gosh, <clears throat> excuse me. She's like, I feel so much better. I like it oh. actually worked by the end of the day. You know, she had started, you know, saying that she needed help. And, uh, oh. And so this is one of those things, like the puns that you read and this joke, beautiful joke that you performed, really. Um, this is not something as, as, as a person who was running a business for 19 years, who was very serious, who was working at a computer all day. So I have no laugh lines, none, because I sit at a computer with a blank look on my face. Like I didn't turn to humor very often for help. 
you know, I was, I was driving, I was trying to get my family fed, I was doing all the things and trying to do all the things. And so, and I think so many people are in that boat, you know, that I've worked with over the years where, um, and they hit this thing of burnout and, you know, all this stuff, um, or some crisis happens, like we're all in this boat right now, or a health crisis happens. And, and you suddenly start looking at like, why haven't I been laughing more all along? Like, what's, what's that about? And so I just love that you automatically turned to these beautiful jokes and these, you know, these puns and that, and, and so I'm just, I'm wondering, is laughter, I know it's something that you perform. I know it's something that you write. It sounds like it's something that's kind of embedded in your heart, but is it something that you turn to as something when you're like, I need to laugh, like just personally? Yeah, it's just in my makeup that I don't even consciously think, come on, laughter, get on board. It's just already on the train. That's awesome. You know, and what, what immediately comes to mind is the research on how contagious we are to each other. That, Especially now. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. And that if we spend time with people who smile, we smile more. If they're if they're if they're happy, if their worldview is more lighthearted, and if we spend time with people, you know, we we tend to make the same amount of money that the people we spend time with make, and we tend. So there's all these really yeah, right. I didn't know that. Yes, and I gotta start hanging out on Summit Avenue. I know, right? So we are we are super contagious in multiple different ways. And if you're healthy, you know, it's, it's, if you drink a lot of soda, like, I mean, there's just these behaviors that we pass to each other or traits really, I guess. And so one of the suggestions of researchers is always, if you want to be happier, if you want to have more laughter in your life, hang out with people that that's their worldview. And it will very soon become your worldview because you'll kind of learn how to look at the world that way. And so, um, when this is over, will you just come on over to my house and we'll just hang for a while? <laughs> like maybe right. we'll send me your address and I'll be over. Yeah. yeah. Once a week. You could just stand in my front yard. Like we could be six feet apart and we'll just hang. <laughs> and I'll just mime and yeah. yeah. Well so I yeah, we'll we'll be hanging out with you for sure in the future. We've got this show that we're gonna be coming up um, so that you can watch. Lorna do her thing and you can be part of the experience. So make sure that you, you know, you're ready to actually do the chat and contribute to the event. And yeah. uh, is there anything else you want to say to folks that are watching? And what else do I want to say? Uh, let's all be laughing behind our masks. Okay. I love it. I should have worn a mask. I'm going to wear a mask on the 19th. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Arrivederci. All right. Bye. Holy crap. Holy crap. I got the cancer during the coronavirus comedy show.